going on guys, Flyby Simulations here and a very special welcome back to this aircraft dissected series I do on my channel, where we do a deep dive and explore every single switch, knob and display in the flight deck of different aircraft to literally dissect them. Now the first aircraft we covered in this series was the Zebo Mod Boeing 737-800 in X-Plane 11, where we started with a detailed dissection of each and every panel and switch in the flight deck, and eventually finished a multi-episode full flight with the aircraft to walk viewers through all of the different phases of flight. You can check out the entire 16 episode series by clicking on the card on the top right of the screen, or by checking out the first link in the description section of the video. Now, due to pure overwhelming demand, the following series will be fully focused on tackling the Airbus A320 family, which includes the A318, A319, A320, and A321, including their NEO or New Engine Option variants as well, since all of these aircraft have the same cockpit design and philosophy and only differ based on their physical operational limitations. What this essentially means is that you can transcend the knowledge you gain from these videos to any Airbus aircraft you fly, may it be the FS Labs A320 in FSX or P3D, or even the fly-by-wire A320 Neo mod in the latest and greatest Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Speaking of Microsoft Flight Simulator, I've also just started a new series on the channel where we do a full flight from point A to B and basically travel around the world with some live commentary, so go check that out and maybe leave some support if you have the time. Now, for the purposes of recording and editing these videos, I will be using a mixture between the Tolis A319 and the Flight Factor A320 in X-Plane 11, as that gives me a good balance between performance and being able to show enough system depth. However, as mentioned before, what you learn here will be applicable to any rendition of the A320 in any simulator. Now, as has been the case with all of my aircraft dissected videos, I will be adding three different types of rectangles on screen to represent the importance of each system or panel being talked about. A green rectangle represents systems that are used on almost every single flight, and are therefore classified as important. Yellow rectangles signify rarely used systems during non-normal operations, and red rectangles, as you probably guessed, signify emergency systems that are rarely used. I'll include timestamps for all the different panels and systems in the description section of the video so as to honor your time and allow you to watch only certain parts of the video if you want to. Finally, it would be absolutely amazing if you guys could subscribe to the channel as that greatly helps me out and motivates me to bring these highly detailed and researched videos to a larger portion of the community. So with that all said and the formalities set aside, let's jump into the flight deck and get started. Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the flight deck of the Airbus A320. So the first thing you guys should notice is that the aircraft is completely cold and dark, meaning that all of its systems are off with no lights or sounds that can be heard. This is the ideal state we want the aircraft to be in and it should be this way when you load up the aircraft for the first time. So in this video, we will be taking a look at the overhead panel of the flight deck and understand the various systems, switches, lights and other features housed within it. You might have noticed that the overhead panel itself is divided into two distinct parts. One is towards the back of the flight deck, whereas the other one, with more switches and dials, is right above the pilots for ease of access. This is done for a reason, as most of the important systems, such as the aircraft's air conditioning systems, fuel, hydraulics, and primary electrical systems, are all housed within this part of the overhead panel. We differentiate these parts by calling this one the lower overhead panel and this one the upper overhead panel. Now in the interest of time, we will be covering only the left column of the lower overhead panel in this video, but fret not as we will cover the entirety of both the overhead panels in future videos of the series. The reason I'm not covering the entire overhead panel in one video is to give more attention to detail to the important subsystems within the aircraft and to also make these videos more structured and manageable in length. So, hope you guys can understand that. Okay, so if you're new to airliners, I would like to introduce a concept to you all called flows. As you can see, in the A320 family of aircraft, the overhead panel is divided into three distinct sections. So we'll cover each of these sections in a top-down fashion from left to right. Pilots in real life navigate each of these really complicated panels in this way to be able to memorize the correct position of the switches over time and preserve focus while navigating around the flight deck. We will be using a similar technique in this tutorial in order to become familiar with real-world aviation techniques. 
So, starting at the top left of the lower overhead panel, we have the ADIRS panel. ADIRS stands for Air Data Inertial Reference System and is probably one of the most important systems within the aircraft. This is because it is responsible for calculating the aircraft's lateral as well as vertical position, its speed, altitude, attitude, and air data at any given time, and send it to the various displays in the flight deck to assist with the flight management guidance system as well as various other flight control subsystems within the aircraft. The ADIRS system itself is comprised of three identical ADIRUs, which stand for Air Data Inertial Reference Units, which provide three-way telemetry and guidance data throughout the flight in order to be able to plot the exact position of the aircraft in 3D space at any given time. Each of these ADIRUs have two components to them, the ADR component as well as the IR component. The ADR stands for Air Data Reference and is responsible for providing information such as the barometric altitude, airspeed, angle of attack, and so on. The IR on the other hand, which stands for Inertial Reference, is responsible for providing information such as the attitude, the heading, the track that the aircraft is flying, and so on. Now unlike the ADR, the IR does not navigate but simply sends navigational data to the onboard flight management computers for navigational computations. So now that we've covered the ADIRS system, let's look at the switches and knobs on this panel. Starting at the top here, we have the main ADIRS system indicator, which shows the status of the ADIRS system at any time. You will normally see an on-bat indication here to signify that the ADIRS system is using battery power while calibrating the system before flight. Coming underneath, we have three knobs to control the individual ADIRUs, as well as two sets of three corresponding lights to go along with them. Starting with the knobs, pilots would normally turn on all three of them to the middle nav position before flight to be able to align the ADIRS system. Above these knobs are the IR component lights, which can either show a fault indication or an align indication depending on the state of the specific ADIRU system. A fault obviously indicates a problem with the corresponding ADIRU, and an align light signifies that the specific ADIRU is in the process of aligning. Similarly, the lights below these knobs are the ADR component switches, which show either a fault indication or an off indication both of which are pretty self-explanatory. At this time, I would like to point out that if you're a beginner and are feeling too overwhelmed, that is completely normal. You haven't seen these switches in action yet or during flight, but when you do, everything will make perfect sense, so just bear with me here. Alright, so coming underneath, we have the flight control panel. So this panel is kind of weird because part of it is here on the left side of the overhead panel and the other half is way on the other right side. So we'll cover both sides here at once just to avoid any confusion and so we can cover everything to do with the flight control system in one go. So the flight control system within the aircraft is responsible for actually controlling the various physical movable surfaces within the aircraft such as the ailerons for rolling, the vertical stabilizers for pitching, and the horizontal stabilizers for yawing the aircraft. So the flight control panel itself consists of three different types of systems. Starting from the left, we have the ELAC system, which stands for Elevator Aileron Computers, which, you probably guessed it, controls the movement of the elevators and the ailerons in the aircraft. ELAC-1 on the left side commands the operation of the ailerons, whereas ELAC-2 commands the operation of the elevators. This is simply done for redundancy and backup, since if one of the ELAC system fails, for example, pilots can still use another method to turn the aircraft. Coming to the right, we have the SEC system, which stands for Spoiler Elevator Computers, and is obviously responsible for controlling the spoilers within the aircraft. There are three systems in this case, SEC1, SEC2, and SEC3, which all have different functions for backup and redundancy. Finally, on the right here, we have the FAC system, which stands for Flight Augmentation Computers. This system is primarily responsible for yaw damping movements and subtle course corrections during flight to be able to maintain the right lateral and vertical flight path. Now if you're coming from a Boeing, this system does the job of a yaw damper, but also has other functions. As with most other systems, there are two FACs, FAC1 on the left and FAC2 on the right. 
all of these switches act as both lights as well as switches. No light signifies that these systems are operating normally. An off light obviously signifies that those systems have been manually turned off by the pilots, and a fault light signifies that there is a fault with that specific flight control system. Coming further underneath, we have the emergency evacuation panel, which pilots use to be able to trigger an evacuation in case of an emergency on the ground. Starting from the left here, we have the evacuation command switch, which is a guarded switch that when pushed, sounds an alarm throughout the cabin alerting the flight attendants to begin the evacuation. This is what the alarm sounds like. To turn off the alarm, simply press the button again and close the guard. Right next to this button, we have the evacuation horn shutoff button, which when pressed, silences the evacuation horn in the flight deck. Keep in mind that the alarm will still play in the rest of the aircraft, but pilots have the option to shut it off in the flight deck itself to concentrate on performing their duties to aid with the evacuation. Finally, on the right, we have another evacuation switch, which also has two positions. When switched to this captain and purse position, the evacuation alarm can be triggered by both the pilots as well as the flight attendants in the cabin. When it is switched to this captain position, the alarm can only be triggered by the pilots in the flight deck. You won't need these switches in a simulator environment, but just some theory for you folks who like the extra bit of detail in your life. Alright, so coming further underneath, we have the emergency electrical control panel. Now, I must preface this section by saying that my knowledge of electronics and electrical components in general is not at the highest level, so what you'll learn here is purely coming from research and hours of reading and asking questions to real-world Airbus pilots. So, starting again from the left, we have the Emergency Generator Test Switch, which is normally only used by ground personnel and maintenance staff to verify normal operation of the electrical buses powered by AC or alternate current. Again, you will never touch the switch even if you're a real-world pilot, as it's purely for maintenance purposes. Coming to the right, we have this Generator 1 line switch, which shows the status of Generator 1 by either showing an off light or a smoke light. An off light obviously signifies that the line connecting Generator 1 has been manually turned off. The smoke light, on the other hand, illuminates when smoke has been detected within the avionics ventilation system, which is the complex array of wires and electronic circuits that make up the overall electrical and flight management system within the aircraft. In the event that smoke is detected, the aircraft must be placed in the smoke configuration to ensure safety of other flight components. Again, this is an emergency system and is normally never used in day-to-day -day flight operations. Coming further right, we have the RAT, an emergency generator manual on switch. Now the RAT and the emergency generator are actually two different components that work in conjunction to provide power in case of a dual engine failure or complete power loss in the aircraft mid-flight. So let's start with the RAT, which stands for Ram Air Turbine, which is a little fan-like contraption that extends down from the belly of the aircraft. The incoming air will spin this rat, which acts as a sort of mini windmill to be able to aid in producing electrical power for basic aircraft operation. The emergency generator is connected to this rat and is responsible for taking the kinetic energy of the turbine and turning it into useful electrical energy to be able to perform an emergency landing using important subsystems. So, starting with this indication light over here, the fault light illuminates when there's obviously a fault with either the rat or the emergency generator or both. The red guarded switch right next to it is normally in the auto configuration, where the rat will automatically deploy in case of a power loss during an emergency. If in some situation, however, the rat doesn't deploy automatically or the emergency generator doesn't kick in, pilots can push this button in to be able to manually aid the process. I hope that made sense. If there are any real-world Airbus A320 pilots in the comment section below, please let me know if I missed something here. I'm looking at you into the blue simulations. Okay, so coming further underneath, we have the EGPWS control panel, which stands for Enhanced Ground Proximity Warning System, and is responsible for enunciating various sounds within the cockpit depending on the phase of flight. These sounds include everything from the minimums callouts when the aircraft is descending towards the runway, all the way to terrain warnings and other such auditory as well as visual caution messages. 
On the panel itself, we have five different GPWS inhibit switches, which basically allow pilots to silence certain GPWS callouts during specific circumstances. So let's start from the left and work our way to the right. On the left, we have the terrain switch, which when switched off, inhibits all terrain caution messages. When no light is illuminated, that signifies that the terrain callouts are active and will sound wherever applicable. Finally, we also have a fault light, which obviously indicates a fault with the terrain mapping and enunciating system. To the right of this switch, we have the system switch, which also has three modes, on, off, and fault. This switch is sort of like the master GPWS switch, so when no light is illuminated, the system is working as intended. When the switch is turned off, the entire GPWS system is inhibited and a fault light obviously indicates a fault with the entire GPWS system. The next three switches don't have fault lights and are simply just on-off switches. So we have the GS mode switch here, which pertains to glide slope callouts during descent and landing. Right next to it, we have the flap mode switch, which when switched off, silences automated warnings such as too low, flaps, and other such callouts which can be of nuisance to pilots who have planned and anticipated for a lower flap landing. Finally, here we have the landing flap 3 switch, which pilots select when landing at airports, typically at higher altitudes. Now unlike the Boeing 737 where pilots can choose between flap 30 and flap 40 landing configurations for a regular landing, one normally always lands with config full or full flap configuration in an Airbus A320. Hence, pilots will normally turn this switch off whenever they decide to perform a config 3 or flap 3 landing and don't want to be bothered by annoying voice callouts. Alright ladies and gentlemen, we're almost done with the left side of the overhead panel, just a few more systems left. So coming underneath, we have the recorder panel, which consists of the CVR or cockpit voice recorder, as well as the DFDR or the digital flight data recorder. All of these systems are part of the colloquially used black box system, which allows air crash investigators to be able to uncover pilot communications as well as other flight related actions performed by the pilots moments before a crash. Both the CVR and DFDR become automatically operational for 5 minutes after electrical power has been first established and then turn off. They then turn on when either one of the engines are started and remain running until 5 minutes after the last engine has been shut down. As for the switches themselves, we first have the ground control switch here, which allows pilots to turn on both the recorders manually outside of the normal operation times and is normally used to be able to test the recording systems. Coming to the right of this switch, we have the CVR Erase button, which allows pilots to manually erase all previously recorded voice communication since the beginning of that particular flight. In order to do this, pilots must press this button and hold for 2 seconds, and also make sure that the aircraft is on the ground with the parking brake set. To the right of this button, we have the CVR Test button, which allows pilots to test the CVR system by means of a low frequency tone that is sounded throughout the flight deck signifying that the system is operating nominally. The tone sounds like this. Okay, so coming down below the recorder panel, we have the oxygen panel, which houses all the primary passenger and crew oxygen systems. So starting from the left, we have the oxygen mask manual on switch. The switch is normally set to the auto position, meaning that the oxygen masks back in the cabin would automatically deploy as soon as the cabin altitude exceeds 14,000 feet. A more detailed explanation of cabin depressurization and lack of oxygen can be found in my 737 aircraft dissected video in the card on the top right hand corner of the screen. Now if there's a fault with the oxygen system and the oxygen masks don't deploy automatically, then pilots can flip open this guard and press the switch to deploy them manually. Right next to the switch, we have the passenger oxygen system on light. This light illuminates with a system on indication every time the oxygen mask doors above the passenger seats are actuated and are providing oxygen when the masks have actually been deployed. Right next to the passenger oxygen on light, we have the oxygen crew supply switch. Similar to the passenger oxygen system light, the crew supply switch also illuminates an off light, signifying when the supply of low pressure oxygen has been restricted to the specialized oxygen masks located in the flight deck for pilots to use. 
However, unlike the previous light, the oxygen crew supply switch also acts as a button and allows pilots to manually turn on the flow of oxygen to their oxygen masks in case of a rapid or gradual drop in cabin pressure. So, coming to the penultimate panel on this side of the overhead panel, we have the calls panel, which essentially allows pilots to grab the attention of flight attendants in the cabin. So again, starting from the left, the mech button, when pushed, indicates a call to ground personnel through an audio output device located near the front of the nose landing gear. Pilots can use this button to directly communicate with ground personnel during ground operations. Moving to the right, we have a forward and aft call switch, both of which produce a chime as well as a pink light in the corresponding area of the cabin to grab the flight attendant's attention. The chime sounds like this. Lastly, on this panel, we have the emergency call switch, which sounds a chime in both the forward and aft cabin and also sends an emergency call message on all flight attendant panels. As you can probably expect, this button is also rarely used, and when it is, it's normally to perform non-normal operations with the aircraft. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the windshield wiper panel, where we have one button and one switch left to cover. So, this little switch here is the rain repellent switch, and as you can see, it's unclickable in the simulator with both the Flight Factor A320 as well as the Tolis A319. In the real aircraft, however, the rain repellent button is inhibited, meaning it does not work when the aircraft is on the ground and the engines turned off. However, during flight, if the button is pushed, a timer is activated which applies a measured quantity of rain repellent fluid on the applicable windshield. Right next to the rain repellent button, we have a windscreen wiper switch, which obviously controls the windscreen wiper in front of the windshield. You can cycle this between the off, slow, and fast modes depending on the intensity of the precipitation being encountered. Similar to the flight control panel, both the button and the switch on the left side can also be found on the right side to control the first officer's windshield. And that's that for the left side of the overhead panel. Alright ladies and gentlemen, so that brings us to the end of the first episode in the Aircraft Dissected series for the A320. If you made it this far, congratulations! You now have a sound understanding regarding various important subsystems within the aircraft, such as the ADIRS, the flight control systems, as well as the emergency systems such as the evacuation panel and the emergency generator system. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description, including a written text version of this entire video if you prefer to read those and understand more about this aircraft. That being said, the next video in the series will focus on the center column of the lower overhead panel, which contains everything from the hydraulics, fuel, and primary electrical and air conditioning systems within the aircraft, so stay tuned for that. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at that like button and the subscribe button, and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comment section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.